Tonight's programme is about Billy Connolly. We've called it The Works, and we've called it The Works because there's an interview, there's part of a play which Connolly's written, there's an extract from a new film in which he appears, and there are generous chunks from his one-man show, which has just finished a tour of the United Kingdom. We think it's the biggest ever series of one-night stands to be undertaken by a comedian. Connolly visited 56 towns, constantly shaping and reshaping his material, drawing the proverbial packed houses everywhere, and that included a week in Drury Line, London. The main thing that interests the producer of the programme, Tony Cash, and myself about Billy Connolly is that he's so original and that he works like a writer. He's got very clear ideas about his ambitions and his purpose. We filmed with Billy Connolly while he was on this mammoth tour of England and Scotland, playing one-night stands in more than 50 cities. On this occasion, the entourage were en route from the West Country to Reading. Before becoming a comedian, Billy Connolly was for several years a folk singer and with Jerry Rafferty, a founder member of the rock group, The Humble Bums. The banjo is still featured heavily in Connolly's show. Prior to working as a professional musician, Billy Connolly was first a welder working on the Clyde and then for a time a paratrooper in the Territorial Army. All 1,200 seats at the Hexagon Theatre Reading had been sold within an hour. Like a rock and roll group or touring theatre ensemble, Billy Connolly takes his stage and sound equipment to every venue. He's recorded extracts during this tour for an album later in the year, the seventh long player of his work to appear. No other comedian has ever released so much live material to the public. It's a lullaby for Glasgow, really. <laughs> yeah, we've got a great scene in Glasgow. You wait till the kids are half asleep, nip upstairs and get your own back. <laughs> Andrews! I said Andrews! <laughs> you probably heard me, I said Andrews! You make my bowels move! You make everything groovy. Last verse. What do you want, Grey's Elegy? I had a glass and a half. I had a glass and a half. No kidding. I had a glass and a half. And now I'm scared to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you move me. <laughs> you make it easy. <laughs> oh, Andrews. Oh. <laughs> When you started, you used to uh, perform in folk clubs and you used to tell stories before you sang the songs. Did you start then by telling stories about um, bodily functions? <laughs> no, I didn't really. I kind of... I used to sing Appalachian mountain music and uh, the songs were so kind of banal. I used to exaggerate on them and... Uh, I don't really remember quite what I did in the folk clubs, but uh, I would exaggerate the story, make it bizarre and... Uh, but the bodily function things came later. When I... I remember the night I did it, it was in Motherwell, in a place called the Garion Hotel. And I said one of those bodily words, and everybody fell about. And he... one of those sort of, uh, 
below the waist once. And I said, but no, 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 no. Did you feel, why did you think they fell about because you were breaking a taboo or because they... I think that's exactly it. And because it was Scotland as well. I mean, doing it in London wouldn't have had any impact whatsoever. But the, the Scottish thing, the sort of, with that, uh, the hooded crow of Scottish Presbyterian, as it's called, <laughs> over your right shoulder, it had this tremendous effect in the audience. And uh, I went on and on from it. You said it was a great release for you when in Motherwell on that yeah. fateful evening you uh, used the word which we keep calling bodily functions. What was the <laughs> joke? <laughs> Can you remember what you said? I can't even recall. It was one of the words. It was one of like fart. But nobody had ever said it on stage before as well to my audience. And uh, I remember the release compl I remember bursting out laughing myself because the, the, the way they laughed was a different laugh that I'd ever experienced in my life. And I started to laugh as well, you see. And so I just, from various nights, from there on, I, I tried out various words and themes, and they, it's great. Don't ever be embarrassed about my stuff. Don't be offended or embarrassed, because it's natural. It's nature. It's not dirty. It's nature. I've been a nature lover all my life. <laughs> you can see it, can you? I'm just, just a nature boy. And when I was a wee boy, I used to stand in the fields in the countryside and say, Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how happy I am. Oh, I wonder why the grass is so green. I used to say, I wonder... <laughs> I wonder why trees are big brown things with green bits on the outside. I wonder why the mountains are so tall, touching the sky. And I wonder how a horse can do that and keep walking. <laughs> Nature! It's all around you! When I was a boy and I went to theatre eh, with my father and my parents or whoever, the, there was a show in Scotland, the Five Past Eight show with Jimmy Logan and Jack Radcliffe and Stanley Baxter and it was like big time variety theatre and I left changed I had seen something uh, it's very difficult to, my goodness how do you explain that but I left very high on the show and it changed my complete that's why I'm a comedian because I went to those shows really you wanted to be like Jimmy Logan and uh... no oh god nobody wants to be like Jimmy Logan really but <laughs> Cut! <laughs> <laughs> the, I left a different person and I knew when I was like maybe 14 that I was going to be a comedian. It's very difficult to explain to anybody but I knew. I told a school teacher once and he laughed at me for it so I didn't tell anybody else. It was one of those things going round the class and what are you going to be? And everybody was want, wanted to be marine engineers. It's a great thing in Glasgow. Because everybody wants to get the hell out of Glasgow, you think, I'll be a marine engineer and I'll go all over the world and make it. But I always wanted to be a comedian, and this one teacher, and he was the teacher I liked best too, he, I said, I want to be a comedian. And he said, well, I saw you playing football at dinner time, there, and I think you've achieved your ambition. And I thought, oh, great. <laughs> oh. And he, oh. But that made me even more determined. So what did you do about it? You're 40 and you want to be a comedian and nobody takes the slightest notice of that. Didn't you sort of... What did you do about it? I just tried to get funny. <laughs> you know? <laughs> One of the most uncomfortable moments on the way to being a comedian was standing in the bar in uh, on trains, doing one-night stands. I did it all in public transport. And the way you have to really talk to one another especially in daytime on trains, you know, you're all, it's all servicemen and reps and me. We're all standing and drinking beer like this. Like, and the, I would, the guys would say, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a comedian. What's your name? Very quietly. Never heard of you. Uh, be funny then. Prove you're a comedian. I mean, nobody ever had to prove they were a, a rep for a, a carpet company or something. But you always have to prove it, that you're funny. And, when I wanted to be a comedian, I actually just tried to be funny. It's difficult to explain, but I just tried was all the time. Was this while you were going around the folk club, so you had mm. some experience of... Yeah. yeah. And did you take them on, these guys in the bar? Yeah. I would tell them a joke they never heard before. 
And some of them were convinced and some of them weren't. Where did you get the jokes from in those days? Joke books or from other people? From all over the place. The bars, mostly. I would tell somebody a joke and he would tell me one and I'd go on and on. Yeah. And, like, you know, like, if you're in a long joke-telling session in a bar or on a train, I tell you a joke and you tell me one, tell another one, da 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 da, da. It eventually ends up you're telling the jokes in sections. Like, you get maybe 20 golf jokes and then it moves on to slaughterhouses <laughs> or some, some other subject and you get deeper and deeper and deeper into the joke thing. And I'd say, you always hear one you never heard before. And sometimes you don't remember the joke, but you remember the punchline and take it and use it in something else. Tony Cash is producing this and he's been to see several of the shows along the tour. was telling me last night that things he'd heard a few weeks ago, that big, have now oh, no. become <laughs> that big. Yes, so yeah. that's happening as well. It's a thing I do, like, I, I'll ad-lib on something and keep it in and ad-lib on that. And it's funny, sometimes the story, with all the ad-libs on top of it, becomes a totally different subject from when it started out. Because I think it gives me great joy. It's the only time I'm creative, mm. you know, is, is ad-libbing on stage. Well, I think I've been creative in other ways, in my writings and things, but I get deep, great joy from being creative live there and then. <laughs> hey, I'd like to tell you a story now about the day the circus came to Glasgow. And it was terrific. Oh, the whole bit. And the big top was there in Glasgow Green. That's a big park right in the centre of town. Big top. The people were all looking at it, going, oh, look. <laughs> big tent. <laughs> Isn't it? Look at the size of it. Huge big tent. <laughs> I'd like to see the rucksack, eh? <laughs> Billy Smart coming up the M1. <laughs> so the first half came on and it was quite good, you know all that. <laughs> and all the clowns, I've hated clowns all my life, you know. And I said, piss off. <laughs> Trying to walk away quick with his big shoes on. <laughs> They always annoyed me, these guys. <laughs> anyway, there was, a, there was an interval, and the people all went and did various things and came back in again. And the ringmaster came into the ring. He was making that noise in his mouth because he couldn't get his whip to work. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for your entertainment this evening, from far off Gibnovia! And where's that? I don't know. <laughs> Sounds far away right enough, doesn't it? Gibnovia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's somewhere. From, fa- from far off Gibnovia! The one and only! The magnificent! The ultra brave! Marvel! And the lovely Dory! Then you must guy with a leopard skin leotard on. Covered in hair and muscles. Right. And then the lovely Dorian behind him. And Dorian ran away and got him a chair. And then she went away again and got my whip. took them both and she went away. <laughs> he couldn't work his either. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Shush, shush. <laughs> that bloody Dory and she knackers me every night. Cheer. I'm going to hoop again. And a tiger came out of the ring, slink, making, t- making tiger noises, you know. Barf. 
<laughs> and it did tricks. Went up things and down things and it lay down and stood up again and there are a lot of tricks, right? <laughs> and then there was a roll of the drums. <laughs> Short roll. <laughs> Threw his chair away and the audience went, oh. What he was going to do against a tiger with a chair, I don't know. It was a 12 bore chair, man. <laughs> Threw his whip away. Oh! Gasp! Exclamation mark. <gasps> there was utter silence in the big top as he walked straight towards the tiger. And he said, Where And he sat down, he looked him straight in the eye. And he went, Where are you? They said, oh, he's going to put his head in his mouth. <laughs> How wrong they were. Walked up to him and went, <laughs> Oh, no! <laughs> Don't dare, Margo! <laughs> Please, I can feel that for here. <laughs> Don't dare! <do it. laughs> but he did it. Plop. I go, no, no! You bleed to death! I read it in a book! <laughs> it, was, it was about piranhas, but it's the same thing! <laughs> Undaunted, he stood there and went, <laughs> And as a sort of encore, he tried to squeeze the tiger's jaws closed on it. <laughs> go, no, 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 don't do it, Marvel! We're already impressed! Thank you! Oh, he is the greatest! He is the champion! And away he went. Uproarious applause. In came the ringmaster again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you understand that was a magnificent act at enormous expense just for you, actually. One volunteer from the audience, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and as one man, they shouted, Bertha! For five hundred pounds! Oh, silence. There's no bad reason. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, pff, I'm no dear. You do. You've got less to lose than you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. You. Hey, Juno, you know, you've been looking at it or something. For a thousand pounds! I'll do it, says the voice. The guy marches down for the back. Yes, I'm your man. Are you sure? Positive. Now you're absolutely sure. Absolutely positive. If you have no last minute doubts or fears, well, just one sort of nagging doubt. And what's that? He says, well, I don't know if I can open my mouth as wide as a tiger. <laughs> so, you get a lot of material from Glasgow, of course. Do you think, first of all, do you think? you would have had different sort of material if you had been brought up in Liverpool or in London? I think it would have been virtually the same. Uh, like a novelist can sit on the beach at Barbados and write about Aberdeen with no problem whatsoever. It isn't. You don't get your material from the street, you get it from there. You know, it's this memory bank. I th a good thing to have is a head full of trivia to, to, to draw on and, and, and expand on. I don't really have... A lot of people think I make sort of uh, verbal cartoons. And it, it just doesn't like that. I've missed the point. It's just... I talk about things that uh, hurt, embarrassed me, uh, made me feel alone, made me feel lonely, and make them funny, because I'm chasing the witch from me. I'm not doing it for them. It's not a therapeutic exercise. It's, uh, I'm getting rid of my own taboos, and uh, if you want to watch me doing it, that's great. You know, they've missed a point somewhere along the line about this uh, Glasgow. But I tell funny situations, and I make them Glasgow because I sound like Glasgow. And it's handy. On the other hand, there are particular things which enrich what you do. The, the, the story you tell, the stories at the circus, 
it's it's oh, yeah. they're surrounded by these two little fellows. No, I, they could have come out of Cumberland, of course. They could have <laughs> come out of London. But they're very they because C Glasgow people used to come to Cumberland and we're on the border and I know a bit about Scotland. They seem to me to be very particular in Glasgow. You see, there was yeah. two little wayfaced guys, bantamweights, really. Yeah. And. Uh, and going to the circus still. I mean, they go to the circus <laughs> even though they're sort of 47. <laughs> it's in their bachelors, that's right. They're so right, you know. And they're sitting and there. Now, that's got to come out of... But I'm not saying, did you pinch them from anywhere, but that's obviously Glasgow's. Yeah, it? but then again, if you ask my audience in Liverpool, do they identify with those guys, they'll say, yeah. There's two fellows at... They're, oh, they're the typically club. Liverpool guys. Yeah. They're, they're just Mr. Everyman, really. Yeah. And, and his, his naivety and his absurdity and, and his... Uh, his, his loneliness, you know. Look when the guy said, all the way from Jabrovia. He's from Jabrovia. It's the way he asks it. Because <laughs> he's beginning to feel out of things and lonely, isolated. Yeah. And I, I, that's, that's where I dwell, in that, the absurdity and the isolation. <laughs> and that's why I talk about the toilet and why I, my attitudes to sex, because my father didn't tell me the, the, the facts of life. He assumed I knew them, so that everybody else I learned it from the toilet wall and the psh, 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 at school and all the lies. So in order to... And the fantasy. Yes. It? So in order to perform sex properly, <coughs> I had to get rid of all the taboos and get in there and see what it really was. And that's what I do on stage when I talk about sex. But the Glasgow element is strong in a play you've written called When How Was Long and Time Was Short. Mm -hmm. um, did you set that in a That's particular... real. Yes. That happened to me. Did it? Mm. Were you chucked out of your house because you didn't wear ashes on your head on Ash Wednesday? Yeah, well, um, well I, I, it wasn't ashes. It was just uh, non-adherence to Catholicism. And uh, I got the heave-ho. My father threw me out. And, and, it, and it hurt him more than me. It was one of those... He actually oh, just threw you out because he, you weren't Yeah, good he actually food. packed my bag and put it outside the door. He said, right, on your bike. It was as black and white as that. Yeah. And uh, so I moved into a rooming house in Glasgow. One of those sort of uh, pseudo Georgian places with the square hallway and doors off it. And I would have made the set in the play like that, but nobody would have believed it. But these. A door opens and a guy comes out because I would look like a really bad playwright, which I probably am anyway, but it's a, a square hallway with doors, like three in each side of the square. And people just kept coming in and out because everybody was lonely and isolated. Alcoholics, sort of a very gayish homosexuals, you know. Oh, no, homosexuals, there was only one, but he, he wore a sort of a, the real guy, wore a a Japanese sort of dressing gown and was always drying his nails when you spoke to him. And I didn't put that in the play because nobody believed it, but it was real. So I made the, the landlord a sort of amalgam of his wife and himself yeah. to get the the isolation, the loneliness of, of, of that I felt in that homosexual guy. And just like that, I exaggerate and bend everything, but he, it's the truth I'm dealing with. This extract takes place in the kitchen of a boarding house where Alec lives after being chucked out of his home. Charlie is an out-of-work craftsman. Milk, Charlie. You know, there's a thing I've always meant to ask you, Charlie. Why do you wear your overalls all the time when you haven't got a job? Well, in the first place, I like wearing them. I've worn them so long, man and boy, that I don't feel right when I'm not wearing them. In the second place, if I wear them all the time, I can convince myself I'm not really unemployed. Merely between engagements. You know what I mean? Aye. Have bailer suit well travel sort of thing, eh? Well, I wouldn't put it exactly like that, but you've got the message. Tell me, what about the other people that live here, Charlie? What about them? Well, I mean, what are they like as people, I mean? Well, I was wondering when you were going to come round to that. Only a matter of time, I told myself. You've got a couple of days to spare. <laughs> Oh, come in, Mr. Green. Can I help you? Just checking, Mr. Campbell. Everything quite tickety-boo, as they say. Aye, fine. I thought I heard voices in here and investigated, as is my wont, as it were. Well, Alec and me were just having a wee chat about this and that, you know. Hmm? Oh, dear me. Oh. 
Christ, sometimes it's like being in prison in here. He panics in case somebody's getting a leg over. Hey, well, if we were to pull a couple of birds in here, Charlie, what business is it of his anyway? Well, he reckons once it starts, but he's stopping it. He thinks we'd turn this place into a knocking show. <laughs> Don't ask me where he thinks I'm going to get the energy. See a poof? The big green? Aye. Tell you the truth, son, I don't know. I'm not very well up in these sort of things. I mean, I know he wears women's clothes and that. But all these clothes belong to his wife. His wife? Aye. He used to be married, but she died, poor soul. Have you never heard him greeting at night? No, I, I can't say I have. You mean he bursts out greeting at night time? No, no, every night, just sometimes. It seems he wakes up in the middle of the night, turns round to give his wife a bit of a cuddle. Then it dawns on him she's not there because she's dead, poor soul. And he can't take it. And he starts to bubble. What's murder you hear the first time Peaky used to it? Oh, I don't know about that, Charlie. Jesus, the very thought gives me the shites. Oh, don't bother your ass with the likes of that. The human race is very resilient. We can get used to anything. Tell you what, there was an uncle of mine. Charlie, I think his name is. He used to tell us stories about the First World War and the trenches and that. It would seem, when there was a lull in the fighting during the night, that we go at each other with a shouting and that. The Jerry's would shout out things like, Akenti, Fakenti, hookin' and cookin'. And your boys would shout back, Bee Bob Babity, your mammy's a dumpling. <laughs> know what I mean? Nobody was fear. I don't see what all that's got to do with Mr. Green Greet in the night time, Charlie. No? No. Tell you what. There's a few things you've got to learn about this house. You see, Mrs. Green was off a kind of people that didn't have much gone for themselves. What you might call a good Samaritan. Then all of a sudden she was taken hell herself. She went for a bad to worse than daytime, and as it was happens, she was taken away to the mental hospital, the Bami care. Ever since then, Mr. Green's been as kind as he was. He takes in the punters that have just been released from the loony bins, because they bells will get near them. In memory of his wife, sort of thing. But what about the women's clays? Oh, that came later. I'm not sure what that's about, but I think that's in memory of his wife, too. I don't think he realises he looks a wee bit odd. Oh, I see. Well, don't get me wrong. I mean, we're not all bampots. I mean, somebody has a wee bit of a problem with a baby. Another just can't cope with the day-to-day -day problems that seem such a doddle to the rest of us. The whole play really is about the isolation, the loneliness thing. Where you can be in a crowd of people and be, and all of you can be desperately lonely, although you're shoulder to shoulder. It's the thing you only experience when you leave home for the first time and you have these preconceived ideas of what the world's like. All of a sudden it isn't and you don't know what to do about it. You know, you're surrounded by, by, by one-offs. The play's also, one of the things that buys about is they they, these strange characters bumping against each other force Alec, who, although he's been kicked out presumably for some act of rebellion, is still rather puritanical compared with the others. He's rather intolerant at the beginning of yeah. the play, and the play makes him tolerant at the end. I mean, at the end, he's a much more tolerant man. Yeah. He's learnt, and he goes on his journey having learnt that much. Yeah. This obviously was your intention. Were you sort of saying, were you actually preaching that as well as intending to do it? I suppose I am. You know, I. I so I think it terrifies me. Occasionally, I become a bit of a finger wagging sort of entertainer, you know. Now hear this, <laughs> isn't that profound kind of thing? And it's a thing I avoid like the plague. And then when I'm when I'm doing these sketches or, or things that are, scenes that I invent, I can see that I'm beginning to wag my index finger. I say, oh, change it, change the mood of that. But hey, the whole theme of that was coming out. Of, of that situation better than you went in growing up. Yeah. What was it like seeing the play put on? I mean, did you want to be in there uh, acting all the parts and performing it? And No, I never felt like that before. It was the strangest feeling. I wanted to put it on where actors, yeah. with a capital A, guys I really admired myself, and we handpicked them and they created a little picture and it changed. It was different from the thing that I, I wrote. There, there were funny lines in it that I didn't realise were funny. I thought they were terribly profound and serious. And the audience fell about. 
which is sort of half naivety and, and half being a comedian writing a play. And uh, it was one of the most immensely enjoyable things I've ever done in my life. Would you like to, have you done it again? Do you want to do it again? Yeah, I'm going to do it again. I'm doing it this year. I've been commissioned to do one for, for Edinburgh Festival, for the official festival, which is the strangest feeling. You get, when you're commissioned for the official festival, you get this overwhelming desire to cut your hair. You know? <laughs> and swan around Edinburgh when I'm opera cape and a cigarette holder. And, uh, and I haven't even started it. And the guys up there must be getting totally panic-stricken. But I'll do it. Have you got a good idea for it now? Well, the play is about prison, yeah. I know what I'm going to do, but I haven't actually put it on pieces of paper yet. It's called The Red Runner, and it's about prison. Three guys, and one of them has a piece of carpet, which is the red runner. So it's a red bit of carpet, you know, a stair runner. Yeah. And the other two are jealous of it and try and get it from him. Although, they can, he, he puts his feet out of the bed onto it, and that's his great luxury in life. He doesn't put his feet on the floor. But the cell is so narrow that the, the guy opposite can also put his feet on it. And he, he, he wants it, although he's got it. <laughs> he wants to own it. And it's this thing about the captivity, isolation, that I'm trying to put in. You've done, you've acted in plays. There's a, I've seen you in, uh, on te in television plays, and you've just acted in your, f I think, is it your, f not your first feature film, but in a feature film called Absolution, written by yeah. Anthony Schaefer with Richard Burton, set in a Catholic, as it happens, <laughs> set around a Catholic uh, public, public school. school. Yeah. Um, you play a, a man who's a bit like yourself in that. Yeah, I do. Well, he isn't really, he looks like me. Yeah. You know, he's hairy and he plays the banjo. But he's a lost soul, you know. He, well, it's somewhere between a lost soul and a free spirit. I mean, the boy who takes him up, as it were, yeah. the saintly but rather corrupt, good-looking boy from the school, thinks of him as a great free spirit, doesn't he? Yeah. Because Blakey rides yeah, around look, in a he motorbike. He sees him as the alternative, yeah. Yes. And uh, it was a super thing to do, that. Take your time. Get closer. Shut up. <laughs> Ah, hell! You dumpling, that's not the way you guddle through. It's the first day I've done it. Look, you take a look at that with your fingers. Use your pinky, right? We all talk like you in Scotland. You should listen to yourself sometime. I watch. That's terrific. That's not terrific. Do you ever feel guilty about anything? What kind of question is that? No, I don't know. Swine back there, they try and make you feel guilty whatever you do. Ah, you'll be okay once you've left that dump and knocked around a bit. Here. Take these. I'd like to kill the swine. Like this. Have some more whiskey. Mm. Yeah, this is a life, eh? A fire, a bottle, share and share. You know the best job I ever had? I was in a fairground. Yeah, I was a fortune teller. Dr. Zingora. I'd sit in this little tent, staring into a crystal ball. I'd tell people their husbands were going to come back to them. <laughs> <laughs> or they would win a fortune. As long as they left smiling, I didn't care what crap I told them. <coughs> Can you read palms? Oh, sure. Huh? We'll read mine, then. Well, eh... Uh... <laughs> You're going to marry three times, have a dozen children, become a priest and go to one of them leper colonies. <laughs> oh, what a song, eh? <coughs> Keep your heavenly choir There's food on the fire I'm not for hire Oh, no, not me Give me a laugh and a joke Drink and a smoke. Dee da lum a dee, dee da lum da, dee da lum a dee. Dee da lee dee. Dee da lum a dee.
that film is very Catholic. I mean, it's uh, the, the central character is Burton, who's a priest and a teacher. Um, and it's to do with the idea of the confession and the idea of, of mm. torment and all that sort of thing. You used to... Do you have any religious stories in your act anymore, or is your Catholic... I used to have it. You did used to have it, didn't you? Yeah. And what happened? Have they disappeared because you've moved on, or because no, you have... I get bored with the subject. I really did. I get, I get desperately bored with the subject. And I used to, even though I'd left Catholicism, I kind of admired it, and admired the people who were into it. So it's fallen away from us? Completely yeah. fallen away. But I have a friend in Toronto, a guy called Don Sullivan, who's alcoholic. He's a reformed sort of alcoholic. And in order to join, I didn't know this, but in order to join Alcoholics Anonymous, you have to, in order to get the, the thing to work, you have you have to have God as well. And he was the same as me. He, he was a, a trifle sort of atheist. And so we invented one. And he's a <laughs> he's a very happy man. <laughs> he just, he's got his own. He comes, when he wakes up in the morning, he says, OK, I know you're there. I don't know who you are or what's going on, but I know you're there. And I'm going to try today. But you must as well. Right? 50% of the game's yours. Here we go again. And uh, I enjoy his religion a lot more. I got a lot more out of his religion than I got in 19 years of Catholicism. You know? <laughs> what about a wee Glasgow man on holiday in New York? Well... <laughs> Walking along, being a tourist, and he went up onto the Empire State Building. He was up on the top there, and he was looking down. Mm, great. There was very little else to do at the top of the Empire State Building. <laughs> oh, terrific! Hey, Agnes, come here and look at the dunes. <laughs> <laughs> There's two guys sitting on the edge of the parapet, long hair, sandals, beards, legs dangling over. I said, hey, hey man, would you like to try a flip? I'm sorry, sir, what was that? Would you like to try a flip, man? It's really beautiful. I tell you the truth, I don't know what a flip is. Hmm? I'll show you. Jumps over the edge. Ooh, it's really beautiful. Five feet from the pavement, he goes, flip. <laughs> Lands in the edge. It's eighty right, it's incredible. How'd you do that? It's says, real easy, man. All you do is flip. Oh, hey, I'm into that. Here we go. <laughs> Excuse me there. Oh, no! He's over the edge. Yeah! Easy! We are the champion! Five feet from the pavement, he goes, flip. Nothing. Splatter! <laughs> and one of the hairy guys turns to the other one and he says, you know, Gabriel, for an, <laughs> for an angel, you can be an awful bastard sometimes. <laughs> Everybody, please, smile. Waste of time, if you haven't taken a light reading. Really. That's all right. This Olympus is completely automatic. It works out the light, and you just click the shutter. Oh, it's OK for snaps, but just you try and enlarge them. You see, the trouble with these small cameras is the lens. No problem. There's a Seiko lens. They use it on the Olympus OM-1, one. one of the best cameras in the world. Well, I suppose they're all right for you boys, but you wouldn't get a professional using one. Do you know who that is? Who? David Bailey. David Bailey? Who's he? The Olympus trip. So simple, anyone can use it. Here's something every girl should know. These are Britain's leading aerosols. This is Mum Roll-On. Using Mum gives you more antiperspirant ingredient than any aerosol. So hands up for the aerosols. Hands up for new Mum. Time for another lashing of culture. This is a love song for perverts. <laughs> well, dirty old men need love too, you know. Right in the pervy position. <laughs> Whoa.
There's a word in the middle of this song, Gels, which only means Glasgow Rangers. It's an abbreviation. If I was you, I'd shut up to you. I hear, you hear what I'm going to say about it. I've got piles and you've got scabies The wains get the measles and the dogs get the rabies Oh boy, when you're with me, oh boy Oh, the world can see that you were made for me I'm losing my hair, my arches are falling There's six kids, they're always bawling There's nappies in the kitchen, there's toys in the stairs When I ask you for support, you shout Up the chairs! Flashbears. All my life I've been kissing your left titty Cause the right one's missing, oh boy When you're with me, oh boy Oh, the one can see that you Were made for me Oh, diddle dum dum oh boy Is there any offensiveness in what you do? Do you... F do you find that you offend people? Well, I find it offensive, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's quite extraordinary, really. The people who have been offended are so few and far between. It's almost unreal. But I did a thing about The Last Supper once, and I made all the characters Glasgow characters, even Jesus, you know. And uh, it caused a sort of uh, mild chaos in Scotland. But it was only among people who had heard the record and hadn't seen it done. <coughs> But the people who had seen it done were completely silent. Not not one complaint. It was a, it was a bit frightening, really. I expected big reaction on it. Although that wasn't the reason I did it. But I expected a big, big sort of backlash, and it didn't quite occur. Do your political opinions influence your material? Used to, not anymore, because I've got fewer and fewer political opinions. I'm becoming a real sort of a. Brigadoon socialist, you know. I only believe in the fairness. That was the, the whole thing in my political beliefs. Sharing and fairness. And it was a bit naive. And so now I have very, very few... I have, I've got a lot of anti-feeling for some politics. And I've got very, very few pro-feelings for any living politics. You know, the, as far as I can see, there's a, a lot of Amins and Gaddafis Margaret Thatcher's SNP and, and very little uh, James Maxton you know and I've, I'm a pessimist now I didn't used to be you don't tell racist jokes do you except Scottish racism <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> blatant racism when it comes to Scotland but You're very anti-Scottish but apart I don't from I have done <laughs> and, and some and it's gone down well you know, I told an Irish joke once, I actually recorded it, and I'm deeply embarrassed about it. Because at the time I didn't enjoy it, it was cheap thrill time. And I don't know why I did it. Sometimes you feel so alone out there, you know, being the concert comedian, the hairy guitar playing weirdo, that I felt kind of lonely and I, and I tried to get like them. And it worked, you know, I, I can do it, the, the, the one line racist bit. On the other hand, people would say about racist jokes, about Irish jokes and uh, packy jokes, as it were, oh, it's just a bit of fun, it doesn't matter very much. I mean, why do you feel embarrassed about doing it? I think that is the most dangerous attitude. The, the British people uh, are not overtly racist or anything, basically. But given the opportunity, they switch on to racism very quickly. You know, they've, they've listened to so many broadcasts on radio about how desperate the situation is with the Pakistanis and West Indians flooding into the country. The total lie, the black lie. And I'm sure that in, in pre-war Germany, the, 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 there was a lot of real funny Jewish jokes going about, and everybody said, well, I'm not a racist, but, you know. So you have this flood of mohair-suited northern comedians, the overt racism they're pouring out to the degree that you get black guys now doing it on stage, which I find vomit-making, you know? Laugh at me, you know? I'm a lovable nigger, you know? Mm. And that, I find that potentially desperately dangerous and, and awfully uncomfortable. I feel uh, 
I feel dirty. There's a, there's a world of difference between a, a comedian and a joke teller. And I think the comedian, like the poet, plays an incredibly important role in society. He should be able to see things that the average guy in the street can't see. Like the poet, he should be able to spot the absurdity. Or, or the poet should be able to uh, spot the beauty, perhaps, or, the, or beauty in something that never, nobody ever thought was beautiful before. All the poets I like do that. Yeah. And all the comedians I like spot absurdity in, in something that's just accepted. Truck driving down to Scotland. <laughs> She's a wee blonde hitchhiking at the side of the road. Oh, hey. Boom. <laughs> Said the lorry. <laughs> Hello. Could you give me a lift, please? Aye, certainly. Come in. Where are you going? I'm trying to get to London. I've just run away from home, you know, and I'm skint. And I'm like, ah, come on, get in. Um. Smoke? Well, I do smoke, but I've got no ciggies, you know. I'm skint. I just run away from home, trying to get to London. Don't be silly. Here, have a cigarette. It's always plying over cigarettes, going down the road. Now. <laughs> come to your transport, cabby. <laughs> Come for your dinner. Well, I'm hungry right enough, but I've uh, no money. I've just run away from home. I'm trying to get a lot. Oh, come on. <laughs> Into the truck, dinner road, fags. <laughs> tea time. <laughs> Come for your tea. Well, in actual fact, I'd love my tea, but I've got no money. I've just run away from home. I'm trying to get a London, you see. <laughs> Don't be silly. I'll get it. Come on. Yeah. No, she's tea. Back in the truck, <laughs> the fags doing it all. <laughs> they come to the North Circular. He says, well, dear, that's it. This is where you have to get off. I unload here and go back to Scotland. All the best. I hope you get on fine. Find some digs and everything. Get a new job. And there you are. All the best. She says, you're the nicest man I ever met. Doc, he said, don't be silly. No bother. She says, you're even... I wish my father was as nice as you. Don't be daft. Away you go. She says, I wish there was some way I could repay you, but I've got no money. You know, I've just run away from home. Go to London. I'm skin. You know. He says, I don't mind. She says... What am I talking about? I've got no way to repay you. This whole journey, I've been sitting in something that truck drivers love. He says, oh, Christ, don't tell me you've melted my Yorkie. <laughs> The best compliment I ever had was, I, I did a thing in school days about music teachers and, the, and, and poetry teachers, the way they taught you it so badly. I was in California and an American guy came up and said, how come uh, you were brought up in Scotland, I was brought up in California and I was in the same class at school. And uh, got, oh, I jumped a mile in the air when that guy said that to me. Because I, I see that as my function, spotting the absurdity and, and ordinary accepted situations like the toilet see the toilet's a great place for me because nobody's ever been there before nobody in my business has ever been there before and les dawson once said to me it's time you get your head out of the toilet and i was awful disappointed in him because he couldn't see what i was trying to do what were you trying to do it's to to go where no man has ever been <laughs> <laughs> to, to expose an area in comedy that nobody has ever done before yeah. and I'm going to get deeper in and I'm sure I'll come out of it well you know I'd say to touch the untouchable and put it on stage as a, a viable entity now that pornography is freely available to the British public in transport cafe places well my driver bought one of these magazines I mean he is a lecher anyway but he bought one of these bad boys magazines and I have never in my life seen anything like it it's the one where you can even send in pictures of your own good lady doing things you know no? <laughs> I don't know why they always point at it I've known where it was for ages I hate that kind of publication. Uh, I wouldn't even buy Playboy. I'm that prudish. I find it offensive. Not not Playboy, but I find I would find it offensive in me to buy one and sit with it. It's not the me that I know. 
and love. <laughs> I agree, it's on. And I think it's, I, it's the kind of thing I don't do myself. And I, I detest pornography. And I hate page three in Britain. I think it's awful. And one of my pet theories, which is probably totally wrong, is that this increase in rape... I don't know if there's an increase in rape or an increase in the publication of rape, but the... I think there are a lot of guys in Britain who look at page three and read about this swinging Britain where everybody's doing it. And a lot of guys are saying, but where's my share? It's extraordinary. So reading this magazine, <coughs> but the bit that killed me was the adverts at the back. Have you seen the things you can buy? <laughs> the things that people must be doing to one another. Things you put batteries in and they jiggle up and down and whiz and whir and... <laughs> great, great, great! <laughs> My favourite of them all is the inflatable women. <laughs> Have you seen them? Oh, they're incredible. Lovely Raquel, they're called. And you blow them up. <laughs> I don't know if you get a John Bull repair kit with them. <laughs> French job. <laughs> Soon have you better, dear. <laughs> Doctor will fix it. But you can get them with electric moving parts. You can. <laughs> and, you, and they talk to you. You get a cassette with it. I wonder what it says, eh? At the third stroke. <laughs> Yeah. Should a, should a cheapskate perverts don't buy the cassette? They just phone Tim and get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> the most extra. I'm in the mood for love <laughs> simply because you're near me. <laughs> ah, there you are, darling. You've arrived. <laughs> and uh, with the electric moving parts thing, I was wondering, do you switch them on? Well, you've, well, you've blown it up, geez. <laughs> you switch them on, it's going, and then you wait for the right moment. <laughs> Or do you get yourself on comfy? <laughs> and masochists can buy an inflatable mother-in-law as well to watch them. <laughs> do you electric moving parts, a dagger like that. The perverts can get inflatable dogs, it's astonishing. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just take the dog out for a walk. <laughs> but these fantasies about these inflatable women, can you imagine? <laughs> or even worse. <laughs> Molly, come back! You peeved at me, I know it! What did I say? The electric parts are gone with the clappers. And I'll wait out the window. <laughs> For God's sake, shoot it down before the neighbours! <laughs> or well, the guy going back to the sex shop with a lovely Raquel over his arm like that. That's Rubby's chair. <laughs> Aren't you pleased with it, sir? No, I certainly am not. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble? I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you about the trouble. I just gave her a wee love bite and she farted and flew out the window. <laughs> That's too good to me. 
What attracted you to the inflatable woman, which is a... Which is a <laughs> the which sheer is a absurdity and loneliness of having an inflatable girlfriend just got me by the throat. And, uh, you know, the, the, the total absurdity of, of, of being in a room and inflating the lady and, uh, <laughs> because you can't get one, you know, it, it appealed to me greatly. And that way, again, I could become the fall guy. In most of my stories, I'm the fall guy. Or the character that I've become on stage is the fall guy. And with the inflatable lady, I could do that again. You said earlier what you saw was pushing further and further into sort of prohibited areas of material, into taboo areas, really. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're... Aye, well, I don't about? intend going into the taboo uh, completely. But I'm enjoying immensely being in there and getting deeper in to see... If to see what's hiding in there. But I'd like to do a, a classic piece of original comedy, and I'm sure it lies in there. My, my aims are, are strictly to be funny, and I would like to think that you left the concert, the concert uh, different from the way you arrived, in as much as you saw something that you, you'd never seen, or you felt something that you'd never felt, an emotion that you'd never felt in your life before. Or oh, you laughed harder than you'd ever laughed before. Oh, I'm no a wate by the wall. I'm no a wate leave I'm no a wate by the wall. I'll I come back and see you.